Hello guys and welcome back to the me channel. We're back with my uh, second video on the topic of grimoires, on the subject of Satanism. If you haven't seen my first video, I do recommend that you check that out before this video. It will give you a lot more context than just watching this video in isolation. But essentially to give you a brief summary and to kind of introduce you to the series, it's um, essentially just the first part of a series that I am doing on Satanism and Satanic cults. And if we can find any evidence of a pervasive Satanic cult essentially existing since the beginning of Christianity, or if not before, really the idea of is the Alex Jones QAnon conspiracy theory Satanic cult, does it exist? Can we find evidence of it? And if so, where? I do want to make this clear as well. I don't think I uh, quite specified it in my first. These are debunking videos. I am trying to debunk um, the theory of a pervasive satanic cult. Why it is so bad and why it is so toxic. I will be analysing that in its own video. Um, but that is not for this video. This video is specifically about the history of grimoires. Now, in our first part... We went through essentially everything from carvings on ceramic bowls, bamboo strips, car curses carved in lead, all the way to the Middle Ages. We discussed uh, Trithemius, Johannes Trithemius, the Black Abbot of Sponheim. We also discussed Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa uh, and Paracelsus, some of uh, the biggest figures in kind of occult philosophy and sort of developing our idea of magic. And if you're kind of wondering how sort of magic and occult philosophy is directly connected with the ideas of Satanism, I do recommend watching the first video because that will go into a lot more depth and explain it a lot better. So without any further ado, welcome to part two of Searching for Satanism, the bad news. Today it's my privilege to host this program on a little known area in law enforcement, but important to every small community and every large city across our vast country. It's the area of satanic cults. Let me tell you, so the lyrics to real rock music is nothing more than satanic cyanide. Parents worried about rock's alleged drug, violence, and satanic impact on the young picketed outside Kemper. Parents were actually saw their child summon uh, Dungeons and Dragons demons into his room before he killed himself. You may not like what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyway because I'm not afraid to speak out. It reminds me of the wild man of Gadara in Mark chapter 5 who was possessed of a demon. Pallenberg sponsored Lucifer Rising, a movie that showed, quote, the actual ceremonies to make. Lucifer Rise. But the fact that virtually every example of this type of backmasking conveys a message that is intrinsically demonic. Aleister Crowley was one of the most infamous Satanists of our modern age. And running around in the graveyard naked and cutting himself with stones and screaming. Demon possession. Through killing people, through various rituals that are against the law in our states and in our country. Death. So we're starting off hot with this one. We are coming into the first, the very first grimoire or collection of magical writings published in English. And that is, oddly enough, the discovery of witchcraft by Reginald Scott. Now, anyone who knows um, anything about this book will essentially know that this isn't really a manual on how to do magic. Strangely enough, this is actually a uh, manual on debunking magic and debunking the idea of witches and witchcraft. And really what he is saying is, um, not only is it ridiculous to claim to be able to perform magic and uh, summon demons, it's also ridiculous to believe it. However, there comes a downside to trying to debunk things sometimes. I really hope history doesn't repeat itself. This, because it was the first English publication of uh, grimoires and spells, that there, there are massive chapters in the back uh, which go through specific conjurations and specific spells, I uh, even like magic tricks. For example, how to make it look like you've cut your head off or you've cut someone's head off. There's a fantastic one of uh, knives and different ways of making it look like a knife has gone through things. So it's essentially everything from like spells and, uh, you know, simple magic tricks to actual um, books on demon conjuration. Now, interestingly, we come to the back of this uh, fantastic 
compendium <laughs> of uh, of spells and criticisms, we also find an index of demons, and this will become very familiar to us uh, later. And there's around uh, 69 demons listed. And I'll, I'll go through some of the demons to kind of show you what their descriptions are. We have Astaroth. Astaroth is a great and strong duke coming forth in the shape of a foul angel, sitting upon the infernal dragon and carrying on his right hand a viper. He answereth truly to matters present, past, and to come. And also, of all secrets, he talketh willingly of the creator of spirits, and of their fall, and how they sinned and fell. He maketh a man wonderful learned in the liberal sciences. He ruleth forty legions. Let every exorcist take heed that he admit him not too near him because of his stinking breath, and therefore let the conjurer hold near to his face a magical ring uh, that shall defend him. So that's 69 of these demons, so I, I, it will be a bit ridiculous to um, go through all of them in this video. Who knows? Maybe I'll do a, demo a demonological reading at some point of some of these. That might be fun. We've already seen uh, sort of a mention of the liberal sciences, but to really hammer the time, here is another demon. This is Furcas. Furcas is a knight and cometh forth in the similitude of a cruel man with a long beard and a hoary head. He sitteth on a pale horse, carrying in his hand a sharp weapon. He perfectly teacheth practic philosophy, rhetoric, logic, astronomy, chiromancy, pyromancy, and their parts. There obey him 20 legions. Now, the interesting thing about this um, index of demons, which is at the back of um, the discovery of witchcraft, is this actually comes from a work by, interestingly, a student of Agrippa, and that is the Dutch physician Johan Weyer. Johan Weyer, also interestingly, um, very much was a debunker of the idea of witchcraft. And Johann Weyer um, denounced the Malleus Maleficarum, and anyone who doesn't know what that book is, it is the book that basically justified the witch trials to people like King James. It's an incredibly violent book, and is essentially uh, murder apologetics, I suppose you would call it. Uh, sexist murder apologetics by an absolute fucking lunatic you know th this is the kind of thing like this is sort of what i'm trying to draw on with these videos we're talking about all these sort of summoning demons which, which so far I'm, I'm just gonna say so far no one is getting hurt so far no one is getting hurt by the summoning of these demons it, uh, the most is maybe your soul and then we got people like heinrich kramer who wrote a book which is quite possibly responsible for killing untold amounts of women for literally no fucking reason. It's, it blows my mind. Essentially, this list of demons uh, from the Discovery of Witchcraft comes from Johann Weyer's book De Prestigious Daemonum, uh, translated as On the Tricks of Demons. Essentially, Johann Weyer believed, well, this isn't... I wouldn't call it exactly progressive, believed that most, if not all, cases of witchcraft were essentially based upon the delusions of the witch, and uh, he claimed that essentially any uh, any claims of being able to uh, actually carry out witchcraft were uh, psychologically based rather than spiritually. There wasn't actually anything spiritual going on. It was all going on in the noggin. And when we come to the list of demons, this uh, list of demons that's at the back of the discovery of witchcraft, we come to what is known as the Pseudomonarchia Daemonum or the False Hierarchy of Demons. The Pseudo-Monarchia Daemonum was actually taken from a book which, interestingly, we can't actually find. <laughs> we can find books essentially after the Ars Goetia, which will uh, come into play very, uh, very much later on in this video. However, we can't really find any um, versions of the actual original work. Interestingly enough, allegedly, uh, Trithemius had a copy of this in his library but you know obviously have to read out the latin name for this because it is so cool it is the liber officiorum spiritum but um to, to essentially give a bit of a summary to the discovery of witchcraft it is a really fantastic bit of work um if you love reading a bit of uh, old english and you, you like all the funky spelling that kind of comes into it um, i do really recommend getting these these are actually fairly easy to come by from what i've seen um, but yeah, like, get a copy, have a read through. It's a criticism of the belief of magic. This is anti-witchcraft as well as 
somehow also anti-witch trials. It's very interesting. This is quite ironic, really, that a book which was meant to um, sort of disprove this kind of extra spiritual realm as false actually ended up becoming one of the main <laughs> sources of inspiration for it, just due to the fact that it was printed in English. Before we kind of move into, I suppose, more recent works, um, I feel there's an element which is missing. I could not believe this myself, and I think it's such a fantastic thing that I have to, I have to talk about it. I've got to talk about it. That is specifically relating to the Icelandic witch trials. Now, in Iceland, there were around 134 witch trials, and pretty much all of them revolved around grimoires. And these grimoires were called, uh, I might be completely butchering this, but I think it's Galdrobokka. And those who were lucky enough not to get executed in these trials were flogged while these grimoires were burnt under their noses and they had to inhale the smoke. Now, of course, as most of these books were burnt, we don't have a lot of copies, but we we've got we've got one in particular which certainly certainly deserves a little bit of love. So I'm gonna read, um, and this is from a book called Grimoires: A History of Magic Books by Owen Davies. Uh, it's been, as you can probably see, a massive uh, reference for this video. I cannot recommend it more if you're interested in this topic. So without any further ado, I introduce to you the 17th century farting spell. From the Galdrabok. So the book instructs the reader to essentially write a series of runic symbols on blood on white calf skin, which are to afflict your belly with great shitting and shooting pains, and all these may affect your belly with very great farting. May your bones split asunder, may your guts burst, may your farting never stop, neither day nor night. May you become weak as the fiend Loki who is snared by all the gods. In your mightiest name, Lord God, Spirit, Creator, Odin, Thor, Saviour, Freya, Frasier, Opa, Satan, Beelzebub, Helper, Mighty God, you who protect your followers, Utios, Mors, Nocte, Vitales. The fact that someone thought one of the nastiest things that they could do to someone was curse them with diarrhea. So now we come into the 18th and 19th century, and it's been important to keep in mind, while the printing press was um, in existence, in working order prior to this, this is like the heyday of the printing press. Things are getting like, printed left and right. It is absolute pandemonium of printing. And this, we can see historically, had such a massive impact on the production of magic books. One of the most well-known of these was uh, The Grand Albert, which was a book of secrets which was falsely attributed to Albertus Magnus, a 13th century friar and scientist. This book would probably prove one of the most influential, along with its smaller brother, the Petit Albert. Now, like the Petit Albert um, had a lot of mundane spells in it. It wasn't particularly fancy. Um, most of it was essentially like how to make vinegar or fortify wine, um, but also you had some questionable love spells, like how to uh, make a woman dance naked. So probably what has had the most cultural impact from this, like lasting cultural impact from um, the Petit Albert is likely the Hand of Glory. And the Hand of Glory was essentially to assist thieves with going in and uh, coming out of houses, obviously with things that didn't belong to them, uh, without being detected. So I'm going to go into a bit of gory detail about this one. What you were supposed to do was acquire the hand from the dead body of an executed criminal who'd been placed in a gibbet. You wrap the hand in a burial cloth and squeeze all the blood from it. The hand would then be placed in a pot with earth for 15 days uh, with salt, pita, salt and crushed pepper. This kind of sounds like a recipe at this point. The hand would then be dried out in the sun or in an oven. The hand now mummified would be forced to grasp a candle made of, from virgin wax and the fat of a hanged man. So here we're starting to get into more kind of actual grim, <laughs> pretty grim spells. That's a, a very grim spell. Again, not condoning this. I do really want to make that clear. I am not condoning this. Don't go and do it. it it's not something that you should do. I, I don't really think I should need to say that. And around the time of uh, the popularity of the Petit Albert, we also see... The Red Dragon. Now, usually people have dated this book back to 1702, 
which would kind of place it before the Petite Albert. However, there's a significant lack of sources to kind of place this, the origins of this book before a Bibliothic Blue uh, copy, which was produced around 1750. So it's likely uh, that 1750 is likely the earliest we can date that book. And interestingly, it's probably one of the first that we can actually see the first um, explicitly diabolic books. We can actually start seeing here's something that's actually kind of claiming to be using uh, demonic magic for its own ends and it's not being done through someone else uh, this is the first time we're seeing like a primary source of something saying it's diabolic it is a book which does require essentially the summoning of a demonic being strangely not the devil but oddly the devil's appointed prime minister lucifuge Rothakale. Now, the interesting thing about this book is we can actually see quite a lot of influence that seems to have been taken from, um, you know, mythology that it, whether or not this book actually created it, definitely perpetrated it throughout society. It looks like it's a lot of kind of folklore stories and uh, folklore tales, which have kind of been exaggerated quite considerably. But to give you basically an example of this, I'm, I'm rabbiting a little bit, to give you an example of this, so the Grand Grimoire, which is also the Red Dragon, they're kind of essentially the same book. But the Grand Grimoire was heavily focused on the discovery of treasure. One of the methods to find the treasure to, was to release a black hen at a treasure site and then to sacrifice it. So we're actually, we've actually got some sacrifice. Finally, here we go. Again, not condoning the sacrifice of anything. There is no, don't do it. There's also another interesting method of doing this, which kind of rings a little bit close to the Robert Johnson uh, legend of him going down to the crossroads and uh, selling a soul to the devil in order to be able to play guitar amazingly well. However, in this one, this was uh, described in, I believe it was the Poulet Noir, which was another bibliothèque bl blue book, or the Black Hen, and you take this Black Hen to a crossroads at midnight and sacrifice it, and uh, then you would do that along with an incarn uh, incarnation to summon the devil. And the devil would uh, come and he would bring you a new hen. But this time, the black hen can lay golden eggs. One of the things to really keep in mind, like I've mentioned how big the uh, the publishing was in this period of time. There were so many of these books, uh, bibliothèque or like chat books being produced at the time. There were more books that were being produced than people were getting educated to read. So we can kind of see this element of um, the belief that even the ownership of these books would give you magical powers, not even necessarily the ability to read it, but the actual ownership. These books, on their own, held these magical properties. And in the case of the more diabolic books, such as the Grand Grimoire or the uh, Dragon Rouge, um, this would lead people to believe that even the ownership of this book would put you in a pact with the devil. You have signed a pact with the devil just by owning this book, by touching it. If you owned one of uh, the books which was uh, more kind of natural magic and more healing magic, then you would have the power of um, of this magic just by owning the book. So interestingly, we do actually have some evidence of people um, trying some of the rituals which were described in uh, the Grand Grimoire and in the Dragon Rouge and in the Black Pullet. Um, I'm actually going to specifically use an example that was uh, used from the Black Pullet. The important thing to keep in mind is, while these rituals were used maybe not exactly in the way that you would initially expect. So in 1775, uh, Jean Gullery, who is a wine grower, and multiple of his accomplices were tried for defrauding multiple victims with the promise of a hen which would lay golden eggs or money. Uh, one of the victims was a man named Fortier. He was told to write his name in a grimoire that was owned by one of Gullery's accomplices. Uh, Fortier was then lured to a cross in the middle of the countryside, and he's told to place his money on a napkin at the foot of this cross. He then kneeled down and was told to say, I greet you, my master, at which point a hen appeared. He then attempted the conjuration to summon the devil. One of Jean Gullery's accomplices then rolled around on the floor like he was possessed. And then when Fortier looked around, the money uh, in the napkin was gone, and so was the hen. I'm saying Jean. It's, it's probably Jean, isn't it? Is it Jean? I'm going to say Jean. Jean Gullery then broke this disastrous news. That the devil had taken the money, and they would have to do it all over again, to which Fortier 
complied. Jean Gallery and his fellow scammers were publicly flogged and labelled as swindlers of false magic. So, we've uh, got one of the rituals, <laughs> we've got evidence of one of the rituals being practised for fraudulent purposes. What would actually usually be the case with a lot of these books, we can see they were very popular with fraudsters. They were, uh, obviously, the people thought it was a good little way of earning a few bob, just by kind of saying, hey, look, enter into a pact with the devil, you'll get something magical. Wait a minute, don't look while I'm picking your pocket. It kind of makes sense when you really think about it. It's just very simple, obvious, sleight of hand. So the influences that you can see have kind of been gathered from these bibliothek blue books or, or chat books. Um, we can see that there's some influences that have sort of been drawn from like the legend of Faust dra drawing like a circle at the crossroads. And we can see some of the effects that they have had on modern culture, like the hand of glory. You know, we, we can see that used in, uh, you know, films like the wicker man, like while that may be a legend, which pr probably predates uh, a lot of these grimoires, these grimoires did perpetuate a, a lot of these sort of magical spells. Is it's a lot of different folklore myths uh, mixed with kind of more uh, Christian fears of uh, diabolic magic, and you know sometimes just straight up like natural magic, uh, which was <laughs> was written beforehand, and all this has kind of been combined into these volumes and mass published. Now, one of my favourite things to actually come out of this sort of grimoire. Um, you know, mania <laughs> of the time is actually from the Grand Grimoire, and it's called the Grand Invocation of the Great Kabbalah, or the Grand Conjuration, which is, funnily enough, for any metal fans out there, an Opeth song. One of the first Opeth songs I actually heard that really got me into the band, and I'm going to read it out. I know there are some people who are probably not going to want me to read it out, but I'm going to read it out anyway. <laughs> I supplicate you, O Spirit, by the power of the Grand Adonai, to appear in Stanta, and by Elohim, and by Ariel, by Jehovah, by Agla, by Tagla, by Mathon, Sulfe, Gabots, Salamandre, Tavots, Gingua, Jana, Atitnamos, Zariatnamix, etc. There's a bunch of letters which I'm not going to uh, spell out because that'll be so tedious. After having twice repeated these great and powerful words, you can be sure that the spirit will appear in the following manner. And uh, the spirit will then appear, say, Here I am. What will you ask of me? Why do you torment my peace? Desist from striking me again with that terrible rod. And this is obviously the summoning of the great prime minister of hell, uh, Lucifuge Rofakale. So, like, as these were uh, basically some of the most published grimoires ever, the, the, they were so mass-produced, there is so much to talk about, and some of the influence these would have on, like, voodoo, uh, there's a lot to talk about in terms of uh, the censorship of these uh, specific chapbooks in France. But essentially, to kind of go into it in more detail, I would actually like to make a video specifically about it. There's a lot of things that I am going to kind of make specific videos about in order to provide some proper context. But for the sake of this video, essentially, I think I've talked about as much as I can about these. Uh, again, really recommend anyone check out uh, Grimoire's A History of Magic Books by Owen Davies. It is a fantastic uh, little compendium and explanation of the books that were available uh, throughout history. Some ones that we don't even know if they actually exist or have ever existed. Um, it's, it's really cool. Very, very cool. Now we're kind of moving between sort of 18th, 19th and 20th century. We start seeing the generation of a book called The Long Lost Friend, which was kind of one of the main keystones of um, the powwow culture. So to give a bit of an idea of this, uh, around sort of 18th to 19th century, there were a lot of uh, German immigrants going to Pennsylvania. And there was this really interesting combination of culture. Obviously, you had the German mysticism, German folklore, and uh, German magic. And from what I can kind of see, it seems to have melded with some of the Native American beliefs of the time. In fact, the word powwow or the words powwow, uh, probably come from a bit of a corruption of, uh, I'm going to butcher this, Algonquin, uh, Native American word, which can be used to describe uh, medicine men who were alleged by essentially Im English publications of the time to be necromancers and to be able to summon the devil. You can tell British is always so accepting. 
so accepting. So many of the spells in this book, similar to a lot of the grimoires that we have seen, were fairly mundane. There were things essentially like uh, water divining. There would have been a lot of land where you had to go and find your own water. Um, so obviously it's going to be pretty important when you're in that situation to be able to find it. So water divining or believing in water divining probably would have been pretty important. But there are also things like um, being able to control an enemy's gun or becoming impervious to injury. The author of a German version of this book published in 1820, uh, John George Homan, he went so far as to say in the book's preface that even the action, once again, of carrying the book with you would make the possessor safe from all enemies, visible or invisible. It went on to say that the possessor could not be drowned in any water, or burned by any fire, or suffer any unjust sentences passed upon them. The long-lost friend and, um, and the power culture may seem relatively innocuous, like, you know, not something that would kind of bring any alarm bells about anything in general. It seems not really any talk about anything diabolic specifically, even though there's a lot of accusations of it. Um, it seems kind of just more of an idea of kind of like natural magic, general sort of spiritualism, you could say. However, the power culture did actually lead to some murders. So let's, uh, let's talk a bit about this one. So there was an event at the very start of the 20th century of a power healer called John Blimer. And he was engaging in like a, a kind of like a Harry Potter-esque battle against someone who is uh, suspected to be engaged in witchcraft who is an elderly farmer named Nelson Raymayer. So in this battle, Oblimer saw himself as kind of this white wizard healer and Raymayer as uh, this black magician who gained his knowledge and power from the sixth and seventh books of Moses and the long lost friend. Along with some of his accomplices, Blimer went to Baymayer's house uh, to take the long lost friend book and his powwow spells and bury them along with a lock of his hair. However, this didn't happen, and very sadly, Blimer and his accomplices ended up beating Raymayer and uh, burned the body. But it's kind of interesting, because even within the realms of magic, which would have been considered diabolic, I think, by anyone who was a Christian of the time, there was still some kind of higher ground trying to be achieved. But um, it, actually, in uh, a book by Marion Gibson, uh, she goes on to talk about this in a bit more detail, and uh, sort of discusses it almost like a witch trial. Romeo was being tried as a witch, like so many people had been previously. Uh, you know, again, with, with no evidence apart from, I see you as a threat. As we have moved into the 20th century, I think it's, it's about time that we discussed the, <laughs> the occult elephant in the room. Uh, Alistair Crowley. But, you know, but before, a little, a little tease for you, before we get into this subject, let's just do a bit, a bit of a brief summary about what we've talked about so far. So from what we can see, really, most uh, terms and subjects that we've seen have been related to spirit conjuring. Um, and if not spirit conjuring, then spells to gain money, uh, to gain better understanding and knowledge, uh, using magic through divine power. Yet many of these texts can often contradict each other. And when they do line up, it's usually from kind of a position of plagiarism. And interestingly, while some of the most important books of magic, uh, such as the Steganographia and De Occulta Philosophia, and books of more sort of questionable ownership, such as uh, On the Supreme Mysteries of Nature by Paracelsus, while being curiously grey in terms of the Orthodox Catholic belief, they still denounce the diabolic. So they don't really align at all with diabolic practices, not by their author's categorization by a long stretch. So we can't really classify these as diabolic. Really, some of the only grimoires that we've seen actually align themselves with the diabolic are things like the Grand Grimoire or the Dragon Rouge. But even despite this, the first chapter of the Grand Grimoire uh, states it was copied from the writings of the great King Solomon. And Solomon was given power over demons by the Archangel Michael, presenting him with the Ring of Solomon. So, rather than being explicitly diabolic, this kind of oddly aligns closer to angelic magic. However, I suppose we could take the angle that, um, for example, with King Solomon, his power was explicitly diabolic, and essentially once he was given the Seal of Solomon and had the power over 
the demons, he now had the power to essentially use it for either divine, natural, or diabolic purposes. However, even if we are to take this analysis, as I stated in part one, we are specifically looking for literary evidence of a pervasive satanic cabal which has existed for nearly two millennia, or even longer, who practice sacrifice of humans and satanic ritual abuse for the sake of almost just reveling in their evil. Given this criteria, even the Grand Grimoire and the Dragon Rouge do not fully line up with this definition. Just for the sake of transparency, I am just going to interject here. There is a description of a sacrifice in the Grand Grimoire. Um, there is a, a very explicit detailing of a sacrifice in there. Um, the reason why I'm really bringing this up is a lot of people have said that this is of a child. Now, all the versions of the Grand Grimoire I have looked through, I cannot find this, so I have no idea where it came from. However, I expect that this is likely a misunderstanding of the word kid. Kid obviously meaning baby goat. Once again, on this channel, we don't condone sacrifice of any type, but I do just want to make that clarification because I do kind of feel that this spreads quite significant misinformation. And just also putting this in here as an aside, if uh, anyone's saying, ah, there's a sacrifice, therefore it's demonic. I do just want to bring up, if you go to the Bible Gateway and you type in pretty much into any version of the Bible, sacrifice, uh, you will come up with over 300 different results, pretty much all of which are animal sacrifices to God, even multiple animal sacrifices to God and burnt offerings, very similar to the one described in here. So I think we can say that in terms of the Christian mentality, this is not actually specifically demonic. But what does in fact make it demonic are the invocations to Lucifer and demonic spirits. Uh, I think it's an important classification for us to have here. There are sacrifices of animals, there are conjurations of demons. However, the murder and abuse of humans is not part of this at all. And there is even a reference, like an invocation to Jehovah in this book. And Jehovah is the name of God in, in Judaism and Christianity. So it still doesn't fully line up. So let's go to the 20th century and discuss the self-appointed beast, Alistair Crowley. So Alistair Crowley seems to have kind of come into infamy when he joined the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which was a Hermetic, once again, Hermetic Order, so uh, people who believed in Hermetic magic, and actually had members such as W.B. Yeats, A.R. Waite, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Algernon Blackwood, who is a fantastic ghost and horror story writer, and allegedly, and I'm going to say allegedly because I don't think we know, uh, Bram Stoker. Now, many of the founders were in fact Freemasons, and I am expecting a bombardment of comments just about that specific mention. Stop it. There's going to be a video on the Freemasons as well. Just stop it. But one of the best known uh, members and founders of the Golden Dawn was in fact Samuel McGregor Mathers. Now where this becomes relevant to grimoires is uh, with the initiation and subsequent uh, denitiation, <laughs> that's not even a word, of Alistair Crowley. So Crowley and Mathers became very close friends during Crowley's time as a member of the Golden Dawn. However, Crowley was a very divisive figure and eventually uh, would end up disgracing himself with the other members. Eventually, uh, Crowley would completely distance himself from the Golden Dawn. Crowley and, uh, you know, I'm getting a little tired of saying the same thing again, uh, became paranoid that Mathers was practicing black magic on him. Oh my god. So to get back at Mathers, Crowley would then go on to publish a book which would uh, give out all the secrets of the Golden Dawn, as well as a book that Mathers had translated, which was, and this is the one that everyone knows, if you've seen Hereditary, you're gonna bloody know it, Lemmageddon Calavacula Solomonis, or The Lesser Key of Solomon. Now, Crowley would then go on to publish this without Mathers' consent. Now, this is probably the first time we see this collection of writings uh, translated into English, and I'm, I'm just going to say this collection of writings, because we're getting so caught up in technicalities as actually hurting my brain a little bit. So I'm going to go through the different uh, books of Lemmageddon Clavicula Solomonis. Um, I have a copy of one of them here, but this is only one part of the actual entire entire book. So um, Lemmageddon uh, Clavicula Solomonis is separated into several books, uh, Ars Goetia, which is referred to by Corellia Mathers as the Book of Evil Spirits, and this is the one that I have right here. There's also uh, the Ars 
Theurgia Goetia, Ars Paulina, Ars Almadel, and the Ars Notoria. Now, much of the inspiration for this, and you know, if you've been if you've been paying attention, I have been mentioning this uh, on occasion. The inspiration for this is largely taken from the Testament of Solomon, which essentially appears to be based on precedence. I'm using precedence because that's specifically the word that Owen Davies is using, and I want to be very careful about how what I'm actually saying here because uh, we're getting into once again technicalities about these books. So it seems to be um, Testament of Solomon seems to be based on precedents which date from the first millennium uh, CE but it is unlikely that this was actually properly formulated into anything comprehensive that we would know today as the Testament of Solomon until likely the Middle Ages. Now the Goetia is interestingly a collection of 72 demonic spirits how to summon them exercise them and how to protect yourself there's a lovely little um ring that you can use to protect your face from the burning embers um this is specifically what it says uh, the magic ring or disc of solomon the figure whereof is to be made of gold or silver it is to be held before the face of the exorcist to preserve him from the stinking sulfurous fumes and flaming breath of the evil spirits. We've got Tic Tacs and Rennies for that today. Now, this collection of demons, you'll notice, is 72 demons, interestingly enough. It was likely taken from the Pseudomonarchia Daemonum by Johann Weyer. However, there are certain errors present in the Goetia which aren't present in the Pseudomonarchia, so it is quite likely that this book may not have even been formulated um, originally until about 1584. And once again, uh, whereas the Pseudomonarchy has 69 demons and the Ars Goetia has 72, there are demons added. I believe there's about four demons that have been added and one demon that's been removed. Very odd choice. Now, the Ars Theurgia Goetia is likely derived from Trithemius' Steganographia. However, what, what is fairly common is we do see a lot of rituals and conjurations which have been added later on. And the Ars Paulina, once again, seems to take a lot of the inspiration from the Steganographia. And another occult book that we haven't even touched upon in these videos called The Heptameron. It also has some seals from a translation of On the Supreme Mysteries of Nature by Paracelsus. There's some uh, apocryphal books which are mixed in here as well, such as The uh, Apocalypse of Paul. And this actual section of the Lesser Key seems to be divided into about two books. Uh, the first part describes 24 angels for each hour of the day and 360 spirits for degrees in the zodiac. The Ars Almadel uh, details methods of essentially scrying and communicating with angels through the use of wax tablets. Now, the Ars Notoria, which is the last book, is sometimes discluded. It appears like a lot of the inspiration for this specific book came from uh, the Swarm Book of Honorius. And specifically with this book, it's about looking in ways to uh, enhance the memory and uh, essentially the understanding of the magician. But yeah, this book is one that has actually gained a little bit of um, public knowledge. You know, once again, if uh, anyone has ever seen the film Hereditary, this book uh, makes a little appearance. And in fact, the uh, demon, uh, spoilers, anyone who hasn't seen it, <laughs> the demon at the end of the film, uh, Payman, is actually a demon from the Lesser Key of Solomon. And why not read a bit of a description of him? So the ninth spirit in this order is Paimon, a great king and very obedient unto Lucifer. He appeareth in the form of a man sitting upon a dromedary, with a crown most glorious upon his head. There goeth before him also a host of spirits, like men with trumpets and well-sounding cymbals, and all other sorts of musical instruments. He hath a great voice and roareth at his first coming, and his speech is such that a magician cannot well understand unless he can compel him. The spirit can teach all arts and sciences and other secret things. He can discover unto thee what the earth is, and what holdeth it up in the waters, and what mind is, and where it is, and any other thing thou mayest desire to know. He giveth dignity and confirmeth the same. He bindeth or maketh any man subject unto the magician, if he so desire. He giveth good familiars, and such he can teach all arts. He is observed towards the west. He is of the order of dominations. He hath unto him two hundred legions of spirits, and part of them are the order of angels, and the other part of the potentates. Now if thou callest the spirit payment alone, thou must make him some offering. And there will attend him two kings, called Labal and Abalim, and also the other spirits who be of the order of potentates in his host. 
and twenty-five legions, and those spirits, which be the subject unto them, are not always with them unless the magician do compel them. His character is this which must be worn as a layman before thee. And here is his uh, seal, or there's a couple of seals there, um, which, again, same seals which you see in the Hereditary film. A very nice bit of detail there, and one of the reasons why that is one of my favourite horror films of all time. There's a lot that can really be said about Alice Crowley. He's a very interesting figure um, but I suppose the most interesting thing is, you know, while Crowley is usually labelled as um, this kind of satanic character, I mean, he, he didn't do much to help this himself, he called himself the Beast 666, um, but he was labelled quite wild, widely as the wickedest man in the world. But his beliefs, from what he wrote about and from what he actually practised, didn't really align very much with the idea of worshipping like a satanic entity or... Uh, being part of a satanic cult which endorsed sacrifice. His views more aligned with neo-paganism and with hermetic theology, uh, also with Eastern esotericism. Really, we see more kind of worship of ancient Egyptian gods than we do any kind of satanic entity. However, interestingly, Crowley's beliefs would later align much closer to our actual understanding of Satanism today than he would have been aware at the time he was uh, practicing and writing his books. So finally, after going through all these books and all these works of, you know, magical knowledge, you know, using alternative terms for Satanism, uh, looking at uh, necromancy, the history of necromancy and nigromancy, uh, looking at magical theology, trying to see, essentially, is there something there? Because obviously you cannot, genuinely, you cannot find anything to do with Luciferianism, Satanism, devil worship, and not anything that is self-identified. It is always identified by someone else. Really, prior to the Grand Grimoire and the Dragon Rouge, you don't really find it anywhere. And even when you see books like the Grand Grimoire and the Dragon Rouge... Their idea of what would have been satanic and what would have been devil worship is still quite different from the way we look at it today. It is a far cry from what we see with the satanic panic. You know, while obviously you have quite macabre things being talked about and obviously, you know, animal sacrifice, like, you know, blood sacrifice, it's it's scary shit, right? But it doesn't really align with the stuff that we heard going on during the satanic panic, it doesn't really align with a lot of those beliefs. But this, of course, brings us to the first self-identified satanic writing, an actual Bible, the satanic Bible. Now, anyone who is aware of this work will obviously be aware we are the closest to an actual satanic writing that we've been pretty much throughout the entirety of this video series. However, theologically, we are so far away, because Satanism, as defined by the author of the Satanic Bible, is embracing the idea of essentially worshipping the self. Really, being an atheist technically could be classed as the most Satanic thing. I'm going to make a video on, really, the origin of Satan, what Satan is as a character, where he came from, why we see him the way we do today. And one of the things that I'm going to be talking about in it is the actual word Satan. Really, essentially, all it means is the adversary. Someone who is opposing, opposing God. Now, what's more oppositionary than denying the, the existence of God? The Satanic Bible is essentially a combination of multiple ideas uh, from atheist and secular ideas, uh, neo-pagan ideas, once again. We also see works of fiction, things that aren't even pretending to be real, such as Lovecraft introduced into it. And interestingly, what we actually see in the Satanic Bible is interestingly close to what we see Alistair Crowley talking about in his uh, religion, Thelema. So the nine Satanic statements, what uh, essentially encompasses the beliefs and values of the religion, are Satan represents indulgence instead of abstinence with an exclamation point. Satan represents vital existence instead of spiritual pipe dreams. Exclamation point. Satan represents undefiled wisdom instead of hypocritical self-deceit. 
Another exclamation point. Satan represents kindness to those who deserve it instead of love wasted on ingrates. It's another exclamation point. Satan represents vengeance instead of turning the other cheek. Do you know what it is? Satan represents responsibility to the responsible instead of concern for psychic vampires. Satan represents man as just another animal, sometimes better, often worse than those that walk on all fours, who, because of this divine spiritual and intellectual development, has become the most vicious animal of all. Satan represents all the so-called sins, as they all lead to physical, mental, or emotional gratification. Satan has been the best friend the church has ever had, as he has kept it in business all these years. So, like, obviously, despite the sass which is clearly seething underneath this, this entire book, a lot of the ideas are fairly mature and don't really display anything malicious. Uh, so the book endorses more of a scientific view of the world, and it takes a fairly social Darwinist uh, view, uh, which, you know, obviously plenty of criticisms that can be had about social Darwinism. Now, the Satanic Bible isn't without fault by any means. It is pretty outdated by today's standards. Um, it's got a lot of ideas that most uh, people like secularists, even Satanists, atheistic Satanists specifically, would most likely disagree with. So we finally reach the end of this long and arduous journey. So let's have a kind of a bit of a summary. What have we seen? We see books which refer to occult knowledge, um, a lot of the time referring to sort of Jewish hermeticism and Jewish hermetic knowledge. We see a lot of uh, books about separation of divine, natural, and diabolic magic, with an emphasis on encouraging natural and divine magic and disavowing diabolic magic. We see books trying to expose the ridiculousness of believing in witches and witchcraft, and trying to essentially talk about how silly it is, debunk the idea, show the trickery therein. And a lot of the people who are interested in the occult side were in fact Christian. They identify themselves as Christians. And when we get into the diabolic works, the, the works that self-identify themselves as diabolic, usually what we're seeing is really kind of fairly common religious practices. I mean, animal sacrifice is a very common religious practice, even today. Many religions practice ritual sacrifice. It is something that happens. And when we do see the sacrifices uh, in things like the Dragon Rouge, they're still invoking the names of God, so there's still a Christian element. There's still a fundamentally Christian belief underneath this um, sort of wanting to have help from a demonic presence. And we can also see this with things like the Lesser Key of Solomon. The spells invoke the power of God to protect them. And we can see this leading all the way back to the story of Solomon, where he gets given the uh, the ring from the Archangel Michael. It's angelic magic he's wielding. It's the divine form of magic. And when we do start seeing things that are self-identifying themselves as satanic, we disavow God. We distance ourselves from God. When we start seeing that, we end up either finding neo-paganism, esoteric eastern beliefs, Egyptian <laughs> Egyptian god beliefs, or we end up finding something that is completely secular. So at the start of this uh, two-parter, we had a question. Can we find evidence of a pervasive satanic cult which has existed since the death of Christ or potentially before and has been involved in really controlling everyone, controlling the whole game, controlling every monarchy, being responsible for every war, being responsible for all the evil things in the world, all the evil things that exist on a literature basis, based on everything that we have seen, and everything I have researched, I think we can safely say no. However, I have found a book, and this is going to piss so many people off. It praises a terrifying demon who condones the enslavement of people, who demands a sacrifice of humans, human blood, who condones the enslavement of human beings, who orders the display of tortured and broken men, people with their skin removed, and orders you to die by his name. And this is held in every place of worship. And there are so many. They're all over the world, these massive demonic temples. 
We just walk past them every day and don't even notice. They have been hiding in plain sight this entire time. There have been historically massive temples constructed by these people, and these blood sacrifice displays have been kept up in all of these buildings, in all of these temples. They're still worshippers of this belief to this day, and they are in our government, and they make decisions on bodily autonomy, human bodily autonomy, and they legislate on behalf of this demon that they believe in. They condone vampirism and cannibalism, and they have been hiding right in front of us this entire time. Prepare yourself. This grimoire is called the Holy Bible. <laughs> That is going to irritate so many people. Really, it doesn't take much for me to flip that script and now Christianity is demonic. The only thing that potentially sets it aside from being a demonic belief, to me anyway, is the fact that they say it isn't. <laughs> and the fact that they say that there's something much worse and there's a much worse uh, entity, a much worse demon who rules over a place, which is much worse. And really, when we truly think about it. We cannot have Satanism in a vacuum. Satanism does not work in a vacuum. Satanism doesn't even work without Christianity. Christianity, and this is my claim, and this is the subject of the next video, Christianity is completely necessary for the idea of Satanism and Satanists to exist. That's quite a claim, that's quite a topic, and that's going to be what I'm going to be discussing in my next video. So thank you for spending the time and watching through this two-part introductory <laughs> to my series on uh, investigating Satanism. If you did get to the end, thank you so much. Uh, if you're new to this channel, do please like and subscribe this video. Um, this is something that I'm going to be doing more regularly as a side to the music side. If you like a bit of music, if you like a bit of theology to do with Satanism, please do subscribe. I'm going to be doing a lot of the both. I think it's likely that I'm going to deep dive more into specific grimoires. I am actually um, investing in specific grimoires so I can read through them and, uh, and go through them with you guys. So have a watch. If it's interesting to you, if you've enjoyed this, you're probably going to enjoy those. Once again, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.